We're starting a new part of the course where we'll be dealing with uh, industrial machine vision and um, in particular we'll be looking at uh, patterns on that and uh, we'll start off with one by uh, Bill Silver at uh, Cognex. So Cognex is arguably the uh, uh, leading machine vision company and it's um, an early starter. Uh, I tried very hard to persuade him not to join a startup because uh, the success rate wasn't very high at the time and maybe still isn't. Anyway, he joined anyway and he was, he's their uh, technical guru and there's a bunch of patents that describe uh, what they did. Uh, at this point, uh, you can't manufacture integrated circuits without machine vision. They're uh, needed all over the show for alignment and inspection. Uh, and you can't uh, manufacture pharmaceuticals <laughs> without machine vision. You know, for example, there's a mandate that um, the label should be readable. So what's the uh, language of the mandate? It's not you know, most of the labels should be readable. It says the, the labels should be readable. That means every single label has to be inspected. Well, I don't think anyone wants people to do that. So, of course, it's done using machine vision. And uh, those are the two areas that uh, Cognix managed to capture a large market, uh, starting off with um, uh, integrated circuits, mostly in Japan. So most of their market was there. Anyway... Let's dive into this patent learn a little bit about uh, patents. So first of all, uh, why patents? So uh, the basic idea is that you come up with an idea to do something, produce some chemical, build some machine, um, and you set up to uh, build such things and sell them. And your neighbor looks over and says, oh, that's nice, you can make some money that way and basically competes with you without having put in the effort of actually coming up with the invention. And so the whole idea of a patent is a kind of compromise whereby uh, you get a limited monopoly to use your invention in return for explaining exactly how it works so that after a certain amount of time anyone else can build it. So it's kind of a contract with society where uh, you get some benefit for a while, and in return, there's some benefit uh, long-term uh, for society. And this is how they get you to explain in detail how things work. And, you know, there are different opinions on various types of intellectual property, um, and we won't get into that. Uh, there are obviously some benefits and some disadvantages uh, to this. And it's changed over the years. There's a constant revision and it's remotely possible that some of the things I tell you are no longer true because they were true, you know, two years ago and whatever. So let's look at what's there. So first of all, the, the, we'll get into the technical stuff later, but sort of the structure of this and the metadata. So obviously there's um, the, the number. So at this point, we're up to six million. Um, I just got notice that one of our X-ray patents got uh, issued, and it's in the 10 million range. So since 2002, we've added a lot of patents. And a lot of companies, um, large companies in particular, file you know, patents at an incredible rate. And why is that? Well, it's largely because they want sort of ammunition in a patent war. So if, say, you're IBM and you know, there's Microsoft, uh, you, I hold 6,000 patents in my hand, and if you promise not to sue me, you can use that technology if I can use your 8,000 patents, that, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, patents can stand in the way of doing useful stuff. They can also kind of sometimes prevent wasted money on litigation. So here's uh, the date of the patent. Uh, we have a title, Apparatus and Method for Detecting and Subpixel Location of Edges in a Digital Image. So this is aimed at mostly sort of a conveyor belt world where you're looking down at things 
and you're uh, measuring positions and attitudes. And it's also aimed at uh, integrated circuit world where you're largely dealing with um, two-dimensional uh, images. So uh, one of the things we know is that uh, images often have large homogeneous regions of uniform intensity. They aren't very interesting. The interesting stuff is where there's a transition uh, between different brightness levels. And so uh, edges are where it's at. You can greatly reduce the um, you know, bits needed to describe something by just focusing uh, on the edges. So that's what this is about. And it's about finding them to sub-pixel accuracy. And that's very important because you can always get more accuracy by adding more pixels. You know, instead of using a million pixel camera, you use a hundred million pixel camera and you get 10 times the accuracy. And obviously uh, that's expensive. And also, uh, you know, if you can do that in software uh, for relatively low cost, then that's a huge advantage. Or if you have that hundred million pixel camera, you now have 10 times the resolution of whoever um, else uh, is working in that field. Um, what accuracy can you achieve? Well, it's fairly straightforward to get to a tenth of a pixel. Uh, uh, and at that point, you start to see all kinds of problems that you didn't think of. Uh, if you push it hard, you can get to maybe a fortieth, which is what, uh, what they claim. And that's obviously huge. You know, two dimensions, that's a factor of 1,600 in terms of accuracy. Okay, so that's what this is about. And then the authors are listed. And the assignee is listed, that is, the authors don't necessarily get the benefit. Typically, if you work at a the company, they make you sign over some piece of paper that says that uh, whatever you invent is theirs, and so on. And uh, I guess MIT wasn't that careful when I was hired, uh, and I don't think I ever signed that paper, but it didn't help me much. Anyway, uh, then we have the date filed and the fields of search. So there are some numbers there that tell you um, what area this is in. Those fields of search were established a long, long time ago. And so, you know, there isn't even something for computers. It's sort of a subpart of electrical stuff. Uh, if you into uh, rubber making, there are 10 categories for different types of rubber because that was... So those categories are things that patent examiners know a lot about, but they're not particularly interesting. And what happens is that uh, you submit this thing, and it has to be in a form that's acceptable. Uh, and there are lots of rules. Uh, it used to be you couldn't have any equations in there. Well, this one has equations in it, so that obviously is no longer the case. Uh, you couldn't use gray levels. It had to be black and white, line drawings. And so the only way you could get something like gray levels was half tones, you know, dots with varying size uh, dots and dot spacing. Uh, can't have color. Uh, the language is somewhat arcane. Uh, there are particular terms that c you come into again and again, like pl plurality. I can never pronounce that word, it, which means several. And things like uh, comprise. So, you know, uh, one way to say uh, the apparatus contains certain things uh, is to say that, but that's not very accurate. So comprise means there's at least one. There may be more. And so, you know, it, um, patent lawyers uh, make their money knowing this kind of stuff. Okay, uh, then we have uh, references, and there's a bunch of uh, patents listed along with their fields, and the asterisk means they were added by the examiner. So it goes down and the examiner sits on it for a while. And it used to be, uh, well, it changed in history, but in the 90s, when this was submitted, 1996, uh, there was a multi-year delay. And at that point, Congress uh, changed the rules a little bit, including charging you for that process. And it speeded up a bit. Um, <clears throat> and the patent examiner will add things that they think of. You can see here that the inventors only thought of this one patent by, well, one of the inventors. The, sort of like, you know, when you write your technical paper, there are probably going to be references to your own previous papers. So they didn't think of all these other people as being relevant. And then there's more uh, other publications. Though, you know, he, uh, to these people, patents are important. Technical papers aren't. 
but they're still listed because the author is from the scientific world in some sense. And uh, it doesn't, it says list continue on the next page because there wasn't enough uh, on the front page, enough space on the front page to list all the papers that he wanted to refer to. <coughs> and then there's the abstract. And uh, this pattern is kind of unusual in that um, it's understandable, it's detailed, it's uh, technical. Um, there's not much, and it's because it was written by an engineer mostly. So uh, if you read the abstract, you get a pretty good idea of what it is. Um, there's a figure. Uh, this figure is chosen by the patent examiner out of the figures that are submitted with a patent uh, as somehow most distinctive, most uh, likely to let you know what the patent uh, is, is all about. So I'll, uh, we'll get back to the abstract later, so let me go to the next page. So here you can see a whole bunch of uh, additional papers on edge detection. Of course, edge detection is an old topic in machine vision. Uh, it goes back uh, to the 1950s, if you can believe, uh, when people first started uh, scanning in images and uh, finding a uh, need to somehow uh, compress the information, uh, measure things, and so on. So um, one of the early famous papers is by uh, Roberts, who was at Lincoln Labs in uh, 1965. And I guess his, his input device was a drum plotter. So in those days, uh, one of the exciting output devices was a drum that rotated and you had a, a ballpoint pen and you could control uh, its position and uh, uh, in some cases color, it might, might have multiple uh, tips and you could make great plots of circuit diagrams, uh, PC board layouts and so on. And so what he did was he replaced the pen with a uh, photo detector a uh, vacuum tube photo detector, and then he uh, scanned his 8 by 11 uh, black and white uh, f glossy photographs, and then he came back the next morning and looked at the data. And uh, he had a very simple edge detector, uh, which was uh, misleading in the sense that um, he had a scanner that produced incredibly good images, they, you know, because there was just a single... A uh, detector, he could afford to build a 12-bit A to D. Uh, he had uh, much better quality images than we would get out of Viticons and other devices later. And so his edge detector, which worked okay on his pictures, you know, wouldn't work for people on other pictures. And so for a long time, there was kind of a competition. Okay, my edge detector is, more, is better than yours. And they all had names. And... I remember being at a conference and standing in the passage and, you know, trying to be social and chatting with this guy I'd never seen before. And we got onto edge detection and I said, well, you know, it's too bad that uh, all the edge detectors that have people's names on them are worthless. Uh, well, he was uh, Irvin Sobel, whose name is on one of the edge detectors. And he's, he's forgiven me since then. But he's, uh, you know, he's still trying to... Um, claim his legacy and make sure that everyone knows that he invented that edge detector and he's, he's blogging and whatever. Anyway, so um, th those are some more papers. And then we get to the figures. <coughs> so the top one is the Roberts Cross Edge Detector. And you can see that it's sort of a directional derivative. The left-hand one is sort of a derivative in the 45-degree direction and the right-hand one is sort of in the 135-degree direction. And, uh, you know, why that? Well, we'll uh, talk about the advantages of that type of operator uh, later. And then so Ir Irvin Sobel's operator is figure 1B, uh, which is um, somewhat advantageous, uh, takes more computation, uh, is somewhat more resistant to noise, is not as high resolution, and so on. And then uh, Bill Silver... Uh, having uh, been to my classes, uh, was interested in hexagonal tessellations. And so he proposed these alternate um, operators uh, which would work on a hexagonal grid. Unfortunately, you know, no one ever built uh, hexagonal grid uh, cameras. Uh, uh, they have some advantages in terms of uh, resolution and rotational symmetry. 
Um, but it's not a huge advantage. It's like um, you know, 4 over pi. So there's an advantage of some sort, but it's not huge. And so the extra trouble of working with a hexagonal grid apparently was too much for engineers. Uh, this one here uh, goes off in three different directions, which is appropriate for hexagonal grid. But of course, that's redundant. Uh, you know, if you have the d, uh, d e d x and d e d y, you've got everything. So there are two degrees of freedom to the brightness gradient. You don't really need three numbers. So he came up with this alternate pattern here, where this one is estimating the derivative in the x direction, and this one in the y direction. And the square root of three is because these cells are further apart than those cells, so you have to compensate for that. Okay, <clears throat> so a key step uh, right up front is to convert from uh, Cartesian to polar coordinates uh, in that you want the uh, magnitude of the gradient and its direction rather than the brightness gradient itself, the x and y components. And so up there is a formula, you know, you can take the square root of the sum of squares and you take the arctangent. And part of that is sort of uh, put out as a straw man, which is like, why on earth would you do this? This is very expensive. Uh, now, you know, maybe today we wouldn't uh, say that, but, but, you know, if you have 100 million pixels and you're trying to do things at 100 frames a second, you still don't want to really take square roots and, and arctangents. Actually, square roots depending on where you uh, grew up, uh, you, would know, you might know that square roots are as easy to calculate as divisions. Uh, it's just a slight twiddle on the algorithm. And unfortunately, in the Western world, we don't teach that, so people think of square roots as these really nasty things. So. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the people who design digital computers are, were also not from this other world. And so for us, uh, square roots are more expensive than division. Anyway, uh, the argument in the, pa in the patent is, you know, we can do it this way, but uh, it's expensive, so let's find a better way of doing it. Then uh, figure 2B is an alternate solution using lookup tables. The idea there is that you encode the X and Y components of brightness uh, in a small number of bits, then you stick the bits together, and that's the address of a lookup table. And... Um, creates a table index, the lookup table. The lookup table gives you the magnitude and the direction. And that's a great solution if uh, arithmetic operations are expensive, which is, was true at the time, and if memory access isn't the problem. And, well, things keep on changing. So for a while there, uh, you know, arithmetic operations became cheap because people just built... Uh, 32 by 32 bit multipliers and, you know, be done with it. And uh, cache misses were a big deal. So you didn't really want to use large lookup tables. And so uh, for that reason, you might want to go back to a method that does a lot of arithmetic rather than have a large lookup table. And that's changing again and so on. So anyway, at the time, uh, the idea of using a lookup table was... Uh, also not particularly attractive. And so he came up with um, the, this method illustrated down here, which we'll talk about called Cordic. So Cordic is a way of estimating the uh, magnitude and direction of a vector from its two coordinates. And it was actually um, pioneered in World War II. Uh, you know, you, you probably know that a lot of early computing machineries were built for unpleasant purposes like war and you know, making sure that you could aim your guns in the right direction. And being able to compute arc tangents and square roots was very important. And so people came up with this method, which is kind of a, an iterative method that um, rotates the coordinate system to bring it more into alignment with the brightness gradient vector. Uh, and at each step, it reduces the uh, error, the difference. And uh, when you then add up all the results, you can get the magnitude and the um, uh, direction. And uh, amazingly, you can do it without much arithmetic. You only end up needing a shift, which costs next to nothing, adders and subtractors, and an absolute value operation. 
So no, if you think about rotation, you think of you know a matrix, cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, and multiplication. So a trigonometry, that's expensive. Multiplication and addition, expensive. Well, um, this is a method uh, very cleverly designed to not do any of that, and and um, you know it can be implemented at low level. So uh, you know in Intel architectures you have an assembly language, but you also have clever things you can do with uh, instructions that access multiple bytes, and so this can all be implemented. Uh, extremely efficiently. So that was the motivation for, for that. Then, um, once we know the brightness gradient uh, in magnitude and direction, one of the things we want to do is uh, find the places where the gradient is large. Right, That's where the edge is. But uh, we don't want to just take a local maximum because along an edge the gradient is going, gradient's going to be large. So that, There'll be some places that are local maxima, but they're sort of meaningless. They're arbitrary points along the edge. What we really want is to look across the edge and take the maximum in that direction, 1D, not 2D. And so we need the direction of the gradient so that we know which direction to search in. And we need to have this uh, maximum finding, which is uh, called uh, non-maximum suppression, uh, meaning we will ignore stuff other than the maximum. Uh, funny term for finding the maximum, but that's what it was called. And um, since we're working on a discrete grid, we have some limitations. And uh, you know, on the particular on the square grid, we have to somehow decide to quantize the possible directions of the gradients. I mean, we compute the gradient direction with high accuracy using any of the three methods we talked about. But um, then we're restricted to, you know, we only have those pixels. So uh, what do we do? Well, uh, we quantize it into these different directions. And for purposes of finding the extremum, we um, pick one of eight possible compass directions. Uh, on the hexagonal grid, you know, we have six possible directions, Sa same idea. Um, now, if we <clears throat> want to, we can um, look further afield. So the previous uh, figure was looking at a three by three area of the image. So we just had uh, you know three by three uh, values of gradient up there. But if we're not happy with that coarse quantization of direction, we can go to five by five. And now we have a larger range of directions. So they talk about this, but uh, it's not what was actually implemented. And of course, you can go further. OK, so the next step is now we're looking along a certain direction in the image. Uh, and we found the place where there's an extremum. And uh, now we'd like to know where the uh, actual peak is uh, to sub-pixel accuracy. And so one thing we can do is figure uh, 4a. Uh, those are the three values. So imagine that 0 is the pixel where you found the maximum, and plus 1 is 1 over, and minus 1 is 1 over in the other direction. And those don't need to be in the x direction. They could be in the diagonal direction, or they could be up and down, but three values anyway. And uh, we can fit a parabola to that. Um, well, that's the best we can do. right? We've got three, three numbers. Um, we can only fit something with three degrees of freedom. Uh, and so ax squared plus bx plus c, we can fit that. Uh, we, we, we could fit a cubic, but it would be ambiguous because there would be one parameter that was uh, you know, hanging loose. We could make it anything we want. OK, so we fit a parabola, and we know how to find the peak of a parabola. We just differentiate, set the result equal to 0. And there we are. We, find, we can find the peak indicated by that uh, dotted line. Um, now, um, if, we, if our model of the world is Mondrian, i.e., we have uh, patches of equal brightness with sharp edges between them, then uh, we know that um, the brightness will be um, constant in each patch. And if the edge is very sharp, we might expect a, a different uh, local fitting, which is shown on the right. So it, up to the edge, you know, the brightness is increased, the gradient is increasing, and then it's going down. 
and it might seem a little bit odd, uh, but uh, that will give us a, a different result. And again, we need um, those three numbers to make that fit. And we can find the peak, you know, find where those two uh, lines intersect, and we can find the uh, dotted line in figure 4b. Um, and those two will generally be different. So we, which one do we take? Which one is more accurate? And so we, we'll get to that in, in a moment. Um, then there's something they call the plane position interpolation. So the idea is that when we found the extremum, we quantized directions, you know, horizontal, 45 degrees, vertical, etc. cetera. Um, but the actual gradient, we know uh, to higher precision, we, we know its real direction to maybe eight bits of accuracy. And so uh, we, what one step we can perform is to actually uh, go in the gradient direction from the center pixel and find the place in that direction where the edge is. So the, uh, the diagonal line is our quantized approximation of gradient direction. And we found at uh, uh, 4.13, we found uh, its peak using the method of figure 4. In uh, the arrow of 4.10 is the actual gradient direction. And now what we do is we draw a perpendicular uh, to that gradient direction and uh, from going through 4.13, and we see where it intersects 4.15. So the idea is that uh, with the edge, when we find an edge point, uh, its, its position is well-defined in the direction of the gradient, perpendicular to the edge. But along the edge, of course, it isn't. We could be anywhere on the edge. So this is you know, just like our aperture problem, optical flow discussion. Uh, and so which of those points do we take along the edge? Well, one argument might be the further you get away from stuff that you really know, the less accurate it's going to be. So let's find the closest point, right? So, so uh, we found an edge. Which point on the edge do we actually record in the uh, output data? Well, we pick the one that's as close as possible to G0, and that's this point that we've constructed this way. So uh, that's, that's that construction. Um, so then uh, we discover that we can get a pretty good subpixel accuracy, maybe a tenth of a pixel. But uh, to go further, uh, we need to take into account the fact that our constructions are you know, based on some assumptions about how the brightness gra gradient varies with position. And we have those two models, and we could come up with some more. And uh, the, the real, you know, what is the real thing? Well, the real thing is going to depend on properties of the optics of the camera you're using. It's going to depend on the fill factor of the chip that's sensing the image. It's going to depend on how accurately in focus the image is. So it's, uh, the edge transition, of course, is not a perfect step transition, which is a good thing. Uh, but its actual shape is uh, not you know, something that you may be able to um, predict ahead of time, and it's the same for every possible camera and uh, image situation that you can think of. Now, if it doesn't fit those two models, what happens? We'll get the wrong answer, but not hugely wrong. So there's kind of a, a bias introduced by our choice of uh, that model, and uh, we can calibrate out that bias. And so that's what uh, he's doing here. So th these are exaggerated curves. So S is the, uh, one of them is the actually computed uh, position based on our little peak finding and parabola fitting. And S prime is the actual edge position. And ideally, you know, be diagonal aligned if you plot those two. And because of the factors I mentioned, it's not a, not a straight line. It has a little bit of a bow to it. Uh, and I, as I mentioned, this is hugely exaggerated. The bow is much less. Um, but it shows that it might be three different shapes for three different cameras or focus positions or you know, phase of the moon, whatever. And so uh, what do we do? 
Well, um, th th think of this, this is now just a correction on top of a correction. So we don't need to be hugely sophisticated. So he comes up with uh, ways of removing that bias. And in particular, you can think of you know, just powers of S. Um, if you take S to the 1, then that's our diagonal line. If you take S 1.1, uh, then it's a little bowed down. If you take S 0 0.9, it's bowed a little bit the other way. So that uh, the idea here is that we can increase the accuracy even more by finding out for your particular machine vision system uh, what, what the S is that gives you the best fit. And while we're there, Notice that when our gradient, quantized gradient direction happens to be diagonal, 45 degrees, then the points we've got are actually further apart. By, you know, they're square root of two times as far apart as when we're horizontal. And so you would imagine that the bias would be different. And indeed it is. And so another refinement of the patent is that you make this bias depend on the uh, gradient direction to get even higher accuracy. So. OK. Um, and so this is the overall diagram of the whole thing. So we start with the image. We estimate the brightness gradient, uh, which we call E x E y, and he calls G x G y. Then we find the gradient magnitude and direction, G 0 and G theta. Uh, then we um, find the, uh, we do the non-maximum suppression, and we find the neighbors. We detect the peak uh, in that direction. And from that, we get a position of the edge point. And we still know the gradient there, so we use that as well. And then we interpolate using that parabola or the triangle. We compensate for the bias. And we do that plane position in, uh, method that finds us the closest point to the maximum that, ha that is on the edge. OK, so um, <clears throat> here's the pattern itself. This, this is, of course, part of the materials in the course. So you can study this yourself. And I'm not going to go through it word by word, but just uh, focus on the section. So it starts off, as usual, with the title and then the field of the invention. You know, Is this about uh, making rubber from stuff coming out of trees, or is this about uh, machine vision? So there's very short. Uh, uh, this invention relates generally to digital image processing and particularly to edge detection in digital images. Then we get to the background. So the background is where you acknowledge that people have already done certain things. So that's uh, considered uh, prior art in, in the terminology of patents. And the, the main point of this section, from the point of view of the inventor, is that you end with where you say, uh, therefore, you need this thing I invented. You know, because all these other stuff, it's great, but it doesn't really solve the problem. And so in this case, what do they say? Uh, consequently, there is a need for an inexpensive and or fast method of high accuracy subpixel edge detection. So most of this discussion is about why do you want to detect edges? Why is that an important problem? And uh, how have people been detecting edges? You know, there was. Uh, Roberts gradient operator, there was Irvin Sobel, uh, and so on. And then it ends up with, well, all of those are uh, too slow, too inaccurate, blah, blah, blah. And here's, you know, here's why you need what, I, what I've got. And then there's a summary of the invention, which is a short version of uh, what, what it's all about. Um, it, the invention provides an apparatus and method for accurate subpixel edge detection. So that's another thing about uh, patents. Um, originally, the people who came up with the idea of patents, uh, the way it's written in our constitution, um, decided they didn't want to patent uh, ideas, uh, abstract ideas. They didn't want to patent mathematical formula. And so um, you know, they, they didn't know about programming. But the uh, Supreme Court later reinterpreted it to mean that you can't patent programs. You know, software is not patentable. What the, and so for a long time, um, people in machine vision uh, weren't able to patent their stuff because it was basically software. So then they came up with the idea, well, what if the software lives in some physical object? You know, we can patent that. 
And so, uh, you know, then they, they all this convoluted language to try and make it uh, be a physical thing. And uh, then for a while, what you did was, uh, because it was unclear how the Supreme Court would come down on this, you, you chose both. So you basically, you invented an apparatus, a box that has, you know, an SD card with a program in it or whatever, uh, and the method separately. And then if someday they decide that methods are not patentable, uh, then you're okay because you've still patented the apparatus. So th this meant that in many cases, as here, there are twice as many claims at the end as really there need to be because they had to basically uh, use the same language just with apparatus replaced with method and some other small changes. So it's, you know, apparatus and method. There was a um, case in... Uh, so uh, patent cases are litigated in various ways. Uh, one, one special one is uh, import. So if someone's trying to import something that you think violates your patent, you can go to a particular patent court, which is in Washington, and you can argue your case there. And uh, there was a case uh, not related to this patent, but a closely related patent. And there's a company in Canada, uh, Matrox, which uh, basically didn't build a machine, but they had um, software that implemented exactly what was in that patent. And so the expert witnesses for the two sides got up and you know, presented all their very hairy theories about how uh, this might work. And by the way, the expert witnesses get to look at your code. So you know, if you're trying to make an argument, you don't want to show the other side the code. But the expert witness for the other side can look at the code. And so uh, you put that person in a room where they can't copy things. They're not allowed to bring their little USB sticks with them. And they can look at all of your code. And so, the ex and it was kind of pathetic because the expert witnesses were being asked questions like, well, isn't finding a maximum of that function the same as finding the minimum of minus that function? You know, so. And the judges just were completely out of their water. And in the end, fortunately, the judges found a way out of it, which was to say, oh, it's all software and that's not patentable. So there were like three weeks of people discussing, you know, cubic uh, uh, interpolation and stuff like that. And then in the end, it was thrown out on a technicality, if you like. So anyway, so uh, that's part of that. So the summary of the invention. Now, the, in terms of uh, patent litigation, uh, most of this uh, is irrelevant in the sense. Th that is, the lawyers immediately go to the claims. We'll get to the claims in a second. Okay, so this is a unusually uh, clear explanation of the method. Again, uh, you know, uh, part of what you want to do when writing a patent is make it as broad as possible. Now, so you have a clear idea of how to do it, but now uh, someone else, your, your opponent, is going to figure out a way of not doing things exactly the way you described, making some small change. So he can say, oh, this isn't your patent because I did that instead of that. So one of the jobs that you and your lawyer have is to figure out you know, all the ways of modifying it so that it's still sort of the same idea. So probably things as an inventor you don't think of first because you just want to get it to work and to work well. And now you've got to think about, oh, what if I replace ultraviolet with infrared? What if I use sound instead of ra uh, radio waves and so on? And so as a result, patents written by lawyers uh, in, almost impossible to read because they've generalized everything to such a large degree. And so here, uh, Bill Silver refused to let them do that. He just wrote it himself. And it's, you know, it's clear instructions. This is what you do. And it's great. It's uh, very pleasant to read. Okay, then we get to the figures. And so there's, a, first of all, a short section uh, that lists all the figures and just gives them sort of names. And then there's the detailed description of the drawings which is actually the detailed explanation of how the thing works. Uh, and there are other conventions. For example, uh, all of the numbers that appear in boldface refer to items in the figures. And if they appear in more than one figure, they better have the same number, you know, rules like that. You, stuff can be rejected because you didn't follow uh, the rules because 
your uh, rectangular boxes aren't quite rectangular. And also, you know, in one place you called uh, the kernel 131, and in another place you called it 141. You can't do that. So. Uh, and here's, here's a formula uh, for the uh, Cartesian to polar conversion equation 1a and 1b, which, as I mentioned, used to not be uh, something that you'd see in uh, patterns. And, you know, really detailed, we're only up to figure two at this point. So they're giving really uh, detailed explanations, and we'll talk about some of that. More formulas. These are the formulas for finding the peaks in the one of the parabola in the top case and of the uh, triangular waveform in the second case. Um, and this is the formula for the bias, which is probably very hard to read, but it's the absolute value of 2s raised to the b, uh, where b is that thing that uh, I said could be you know, near 1. And it explicitly says it has to be bigger than minus 1. But other than that, it can be any, any value. Um, tables, let's see. Oh, OK. So now we get to the part that the lawyers will find the most interesting. Um, uh, where is it? It uh, starts up there. OK. Wh what is claimed is, and for some reason, it's not a separate section. It's just a convention. The words, what is claimed is, appear. And now you list the claims. So those are the particular things that you think that uh, you came up with and you want to protect. And um, uh, the other side is probably going to argue that, uh, well, actually, it's obvious. It was there in prior art, whatever. So, so it starts off uh, uh, quite a long first claim. And I'll read it out because we'll, uh, this is what we're actually going to study, uh, the algorithm for that. Um, okay. An, an apparatus for, that's claim one. And claim 11 is going to be the same thing. Um, sorry, claim 21 is going to be the same thing which says a method for. So this is apparatus for. Detection and subpixel location of edges in a digital image Said digital image including a plurality of pixel values, each pixel value having been associated with respective pixel point on a regularly spaced pixel grid. Uh, said apparatus comprising, and comprising, remember, is a special term here in uh, pattern language. And then it lists uh, uh, three items. For some reason, they're all labeled. Uh, well, they all start with A, so it looks like they're all labeled A, but they're not. So the first one is a gradient estimator for estimating gradient magnitude and gradient direction at a plurality of regularly spaced gradient points in said digital image, so as to provide a plurality of estimates of gradient magnitude and gradient direction, each said estimate of gradient estimate and gradient direction being associated with a respective gradient point on a regularly spaced uh, gradient grid. I mean, you know, uh, you wouldn't think that it'd be so difficult to talk about, OK, we're going to compute the image brightness gradient. But there it is. Um, and, and I suppose the idea is that, you know, to us it's obvious, but um, this is supposed to be um, something that anyone uh, could understand. So that's one. We're going to get the gradient. And the second one is, uh, and, oh, and we're also going to get gradient magnitude and direction. So that, that's uh, component one. Then component two is a peak detector cooperative with said gradient estimate operating such that gradient direction associated with each gradient point is used to select the respective set of neighboring gradient points. So that's the quantization of the gradient direction. So we pick a certain set of uh, di certain direction and operating such that gradient magnitude associated with each gradient point is compared with each gradient magnitude of said respective set of neighboring gradient magnitudes as to determine which of said gradient magnitudes is a local maximum of gradient magnitude in appropriate said gradient direction. So that's, you know, in short words, it's uh, uh, non-maximum suppression in the quantized gradient direction. That, so that's two. And then the third and last part is a sub subpixel interpolator Cooperating with said peak detector, operating such that said local maximum of gradient magnitude 
And a set of neighboring Bradian magnitudes are used to determine an interpolated edge position along a one-dimensional di one gradient magnitude profile, including a gradient point associated with said local maximum of gradient magnitude, and so on. So that's the interpolation step, where we fit the parabola and we find the peak of the parabola. And that's uh, all of claim one. So, so why do there need to be other claims? Well, the thing is that someone might come along later and say, well, wait a minute. Uh, we already invented that, and so uh, your claim one is blown out of the water. So what you then do is you specialize it further. You uh, add in other things that are in your specification uh, and refine it more and more and more in the hope that if in litigation later on uh, the early claims that are very broad are thrown out, then the narrow ones will still stand. So if they also violate all the other conditions, then, then you're good. So in, for example, claim two. So we have uh, claim one further comprising a plane position. Uh, so that last step that I described, that plane position step where you intersect the uh, gradient and another line, uh, that isn't in claim one. So uh, supposing that claim one gets thrown out, then uh, if, you add, if you're using this plane position feature, then you're going to violate uh, claim two. So that's a conditional claim. And, you know, it goes on like that. Uh, we won't obviously read through all of these. Uh, claim three is the apparatus of claim two. So claim two depends on one. Claim three depends on two, which in turn depends on one. And... Um, and claim three as a gradient direction line. So it's uh, uh, giving particular way of computing that plane position point. Uh, and then, you know, there, there's a whole bunch more, obviously. And they get uh, more and more detailed so that uh, you're protected in case it turns out that, well, claim one, you know, if you put together the writings of Roberts and Irvin Sobel, it's there. And so you need something else. OK, then let's see. Where does it get interesting again? Claim 11 uh, starts all over again, uh, where claim 1 did, with a change that this is a, uh, a function plus means claim. So here, instead of saying that you have an apparatus for gradient estimation, gradient estimation means for estimating gradient mag. Peak detection means for. Uh, Subpixel interpolation means so it's not specific about whether it's apparatus or method or whatever. And again, this has to do with the history of patterns that uh, they needed to do that. And so everything's repeated. So so we have claims one through ten, and then it's repeated in uh, function plus means method up to twenty one. And then at twenty one, everything is repeated with apparatus replaced with method. So, uh, you know, so you end up with a relatively simple problem, and it ends up with uh, 34 claims. 34 claims. Now, these days, they penalize you for that uh, because you have to pay extra if you have more than 20 claims. So, you know, things change. So, for example, at this time, um, let's see. Uh, okay, before this... <coughs> Before this, the rule was that uh, your patent would uh, be valid for 17 and a half years after it issued. And that was different from the way the rest of the world did it. And also, it was kind of uh, unfair because you, things could be delayed in the patent process. So something could issue 10 years after you submit it. And then you, like you get another 10 years just because of that delay. And there were tricks of using that. For example, uh, Jerome Lemelson um, claimed that he invented machine vision in 1956, and he had a string of patents that uh, documented that. And uh, some of them were called submarine patents because you didn't know they were in the pipeline. Uh, but they depended on earlier patents. And so anyway, so uh, Congress decided to X that idea. And so things changed, and um, I guess already at this point, the uh, rule was 20 years after filing instead of 17 and a half after issue. Also, they removed the rule uh, that um, 
you know, who gets priority? So suppose you think of some idea and someone else thinks of an idea and you submit uh, uh, patents. And then you have these two conflicting patents. Who, who gets the patent? Well, it used to be that um, whoever invented first. And so in the old days, all engineers carried around books with squares in them and every page uh, numbered. And uh, every day they would ask their buddies to sign a page. Why? Well, because that way you could document that you thought of this idea on April the 3rd. You know, you didn't have it fully fleshed out. But uh, the pages were numbered, so you couldn't cheat and tear out pages or add pages. And uh, people's signature was on there saying that, oh, yeah, I saw this. He, he, he actually wrote this at that time. And that was a giant pain because, you know, everything you did, every time you thought of something, you immediately had to write it down. And so they decided, no, forget that. that uh, plus, it was very hard to prove sometimes. And so they, the new rule is, you know, submission. When you send it in, that, that's the date. And if you, if you take your time sending it in, uh, you know, too, too bad, you lose. So anyway, okay, so uh, that's a typical patent. It's a relatively simple one, uh, but it has some interesting machine vision aspects, which uh, we'll talk about uh, now. Okay, so um, we mentioned that in many cases, images are um, composed of patches that are pretty much uniform in brightness. And uh, the interesting stuff is <laughs> at the transitions. And I mentioned that this uh, Dutch artist, uh, Piet Cornelius Mondrian, uh, got rich by drawing you know, things that just had rectangular patches of color and okay is it art I, I don't know I, I am not in that field but anyway so I call this the Mondrian model of the world and so in that model of the world um, rather than have millions of pixels you can condense things down into just talking about the edges or if you want to find where something is on a conveyor belt uh, you just need the edges if you're trying to line up different layers of an integrated circuit mask uh, then you just need uh, edges. So um, what, what's an edge? Well, uh, and what, what is an edge detector? So again, uh, unused, remarkably, this is actually uh, well pointed out here. So edge detection can be defined informally as a process for determining the location of boundaries between image regions that are different and roughly uniform in brightness. So, you know, great. And then uh, in more detail, uh, an edge can be usefully defined as a point in an image where the image gradient magnitude reaches a local maximum in the image gradient direction. So that's, that's, our, that's important. It's not just the local maximum. It's in that direction. And by the way, they mentioned another one, which is where the second derivative of brightness crosses zero in the image gradient direction. So think about that. And that makes sense. So if the first derivative reaches a, P, a maximum, how do you find the maximum? Well, you differentiate one more time and set the result equal to zero. So an alternate way of determining where an edge is is to look at second derivatives and look at zero crossings. And, and that was used as well. Um, and by the way, then they mentioned multi-scale. Now remember, this is a while back, but uh, even then. Thus it, thus it is known in the art to perform edge detection at a plurality of spatial frequencies or length scales as appropriate to the application. So we're just going to pretend that we're working directly at the full resolution. But imagine that for many applications, uh, you would not want to do that, and, or you would want to work at multiple resolutions. Uh, and so we're not going to, for this pattern, we're not going to get into that um, and, as they don't get into it. So, okay. Um, so we have um, an image transition. So first of all, you know, here's an ideal edge. Uh, so this is a cross-section across the edge. Uh, it's a step function. 
Well, it turns out, actually, that's not good. Uh, that we don't want that. We don't want infinite resolution. That, that seems kind of crazy because you think that the better the resolution, you know, the happier we should be. Well, uh, the problem is, suppose we now image this onto a device that has discrete pixels. So we're measuring uh, the brightness at those points. Now, can we tell where the edge is? Well, suppose I move the edge a little bit. Uh, nothing changes in terms of the brightness measurements at those uh, points. So actually, I can, in this very idealized case, I can move it a whole pixel width back and forth. Nothing changes. So conversely, that means I can't measure it where it is within the full pixel position. So this is actually undesirable. And basically, uh, this is a form of aliasing. So, so we don't want a perfect step edge. We want something that's band limited, so that when we sample it, we're not introducing uh, artificial uh, frequency components, which is you know, one way of thinking about what, what's going wrong here. OK, so we're looking for the, for the edge. And we've said that one method is to take the derivative and find the uh, peak of the derivative. And then we mentioned also that possibly you might want to take the second derivative and look for zero crossing. So this was actually a popular game for a while that we would be looking at second derivatives. And in the case of images, which are two-dimensional, what's the generalization of the second derivative? It's um, Laplacian. So we, instead of these edge operators, which give us an estimate of the brightness gradient, we'll find, um, we'll take the Laplacian and we find the zero crossings. And one of the appealing ideas about that was that, um, well, zero crossings are closed curves. I mean, it's like a contour map, right? So you have this, we've uh, talked about thinking of the image as a surface in 3D where height is brightness. Well, then we can draw contours, isophotes, certain level, and uh, we can draw the zero. Well, not with images themselves, but once we take the Laplacian, we'll have both positive and negative values, and we can draw the contour at zero. Well, contours are closed, other than you know where they disappear off the edge of the image. So that was very appealing because a lot of times other edge detectors would sort of peter out, and then you wouldn't you know quite know where the edge was and so on. So that was an uh, uh, interesting game for a while, uh, but it turns out that um, you get worse uh, performance in the presence of noise, uh, and we can discuss that in terms of convolution and so on, but won't do that for the moment. So second derivative, and it's briefly mentioned in the patent, but it's not pursued. Uh, and then what does that correspond to in the original? Um, e. So what we're really doing is looking for an inflection point. What's an inflection point? Well, imagine that you're driving along this curve. Uh, you're turning left, you're turning left, you're turning left, you're turning left. Oh, now I'm turning right, now I'm turning right. So the inflection point is where you're changing directions. And in terms of derivatives, it's the maximum of the derivative. So, so those are uh, different ways that we could define, um, that we could define uh, uh, where the edge is. Okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, brightness gradient estimation. So uh, you saw in the figures there uh, a number of operators So this was uh, Larry Roberts' idea, and it's uh, very easy to compute, very cheap to compute, uh, and, uh, but it's at 45 degree angle. So what, what, what was the idea here? So, you know, why not um, <coughs> operate in uh, X and Y? Well, uh, it turns out that uh, 
this makes it possible to have the two operators refer to the same reference point. So where, where are we estimating the derivative? Well, you might say, OK, uh, I'm estimating the derivative here by taking the difference between this value and that. And you know, someone else might say, well, we're estimating the derivative here because I'm taking the difference of the value here and the value there. Um, and we'll see in a second that uh, neither of those is well-founded. It's more uh, reasonable to say I'm estimating the derivative there. And the resistance to that, of course, is that's not a grid point. So it's not a pixel. It's halfway offset in pixels. But, but who cares? Maybe that's a good place to estimate the derivative then. And so uh, Robert used these two operators, and then he, he uh, used the uh, sum of squares and noted that conveniently um, that's actually the same as if you'd computed the sum of squares of uh, gradients in the original coordinate system, right? Because if you do the 45 degree rotation, cosine 45 degree, sine 45 degree, it's 1 over square root of 2. Um, you get the same thing except for uh, proportionality factor, right? Because these are further apart uh, than a pixel spacing by square root of 2. So, so these aren't the same, but they're um, related by some number. Uh, they're proportional to one another. OK, so that, uh, so that uh, is Robert's gradient. And then we had uh, Irving Sobel. Well, let's, uh, let's first address this question about estimating the derivatives. And we may have uh, done a little bit of this already, but let's uh, do it more carefully. So we have this computational uh, molecule for uh, E of x. And we know from Taylor series um, and so now uh, we can use that to um, Right, so when we do that, the f of x cancels out, and then we divide by delta x, so we get, well, that's the part we want. We're trying to estimate the derivative, so that's perfect. And then we divide by delta x, so we get delta x over 2. Uh, so this is the lowest order error term. So that's what we want, and, and that's the part we don't want. And when we talk about how good a formula it is, we'll be looking at two things. One is the order of the lowest order error term, which is here is second order. And then the other one is the multiplier. You know, suppose we have two methods that have the same order of the lowest uh, error term, then we can compare them based on the size of this multiplier. But the more important one first is the, the order. So this one's not very good because even uh, this, it works perfectly on a straight line. But even if there's a little bit of curvature to it, it's going to get the wrong answer uh, because of that. So let's instead look at f of x plus f of x minus delta x. Right? So, so here we said, OK, this, this is our x, and this is our x plus delta x. And we're obviously trying to get the derivative at, at x. Uh, now we're saying. Now we're saying, OK, this is x. That's x minus delta x. And we're trying to get the derivative there. And if we go through the same arithmetic, we uh, get the same size error, but the, the sign is flipped. Uh, so well, what you might say is, well, gee, let's just average these two. Then we can get rid of that low order uh, error term. And then, so if we average them, which means the sum of the two divided, uh, the sum of these two divided by two, then we just get 
f of x. That, that's what we want. And this cancels out. Well, but then the higher order term. So we better fill in the higher order term. So here we got delta x squared over 6 f triple prime of x. And Um, and so what we notice is that now uh, we have a higher order error term, which is desirable. This, so this formula will not just work for perfectly for a straight line, but even if the straight line has a bit of curvature to it, a second derivative, as long as the third derivative isn't too large, uh, we'll be okay. So, so what does averaging these two actually mean? Well, it means that we take... that in effect, we've used that operator, right? So, um, and you know, that's a perfectly reasonable uh, approximation to a derivative. We're subtracting two things and we're dividing between the uh, distance between where we've measured those, uh, those two things. Um, okay, and then you might say, well, um, what if instead I sort of take this idea, but now I'm saying I'm going to find I'm going to find an estimate of the derivative there, and the objection would be, well, it's not a pixel position, but that doesn't matter. We can we can have even derivatives be offset by half a pixel, as long as we just remember that, that mentally that that's happened. Now, I can go through and use Taylor series, blah, blah, blah. But actually, all I need to do is uh, use this formula and divide delta x by 2, right? Because this is the same thing with delta x divided by 2. So in this case, my formula is going to be f plus and then delta x over 2 squared divided by 6. So. Now I have to compare two operators that have the same lowest order error term, and now I look at the magnitude of the factor in front of the error term, and obviously this one is a quarter the size of that one. Right? So, so this one uh, has an advantage in, in uh, that respect. I can get a relatively high order error term, and I can um, have... A, a small multiplier so that the error is actually smaller. And it makes sense. I mean, over here, we're comparing things that are relatively far apart and seeing, uh, uh, so obviously, that will be affected more by higher order derivatives than uh, in this case where I'm uh, looking at things that are close together. OK. Um, now, that's fine for EX. But how is this going to work with EY? Because if I uh, take uh, if I take that idea in both directions, so so here's my e x operator, and then you know there's a potential e y operator. Well, that's not going to work because this one is a good estimate of the x derivative there. And this one is a good estimate of the x derivative, the y derivative there, and those aren't consistent. And so, uh, what I do? Well, one way to deal with it is is that. Right, because these now, um, if I go through that Taylor series story. These are good estimates of the x derivative here, and this is a good estimate of the y derivative here, and oh, those are the same point. So, so that's, um, that's how we get to that. And when we talked about fixed optical flow, we already mentioned that that's the way uh, you want to uh, compute the derivatives. And well, there we needed uh, not just ex, ey, et, 
uh, we need not just ex and ey, but we needed et. And so there, uh, we're dealing with a whole cube. Um, and so, for example, to compute the derivative in the y direction, we can do that. Okay, and um, you know, under materials, there's the uh, detailed explanation of how to do um, the fixed optical flow, and that's that's in there. So that's um, now the story doesn't end there because now we might talk about efficiency. And so, for example, um, you know, how much work are these operators? Well, uh, here we have. Um, uh, three, we, we can subtract these two, that's one. Subtract those two, that's two. Then we add them up. So it's three operations for this and three operations for that. But actually, they share these subcomputations, right? And this one's one operation, and that one's one operation. So three plus three is six. So one operation, one operation. And then we combine them, we, we add them to get uh, e sub x, and we subtract them to get e sub y. So that's 1 op plus 1 op, so a total of uh, 4 ops. So uh, by cleverly arranging the computation, we can cut it back from six operations to four. And you might say, who cares? Well, the thing is, you're doing this in, in each of a few million pixels. So this is one place where actually efficiency does, does matter. Uh, and I won't go through this. I mean, if you do this the obvious way, it takes, I don't know, 21 ops. If you do this, if you get E, X, E, Y, E, T, the obvious way, you get 21 ops. And I'll leave it to you to, um, you know, and people sometimes uh, come up with surprising solutions that uh, beat the obvious solution by a significant factor. Okay, th and by the way, th there's Robert's cross operator. So, you know, he was way ahead of his time. <clears throat> and uh, what about Irvin Sobel? So Irvin Sobel, uh, you know, looked at this stuff, and, and this, is, this is where he got to. He said, well, this is uh, obviously a good way of doing it. It's an estimate of the derivative at that pixel, and it's not, it doesn't have a low-order error term. But then he needed to do it in 2D, so he replicated it. But why did he replicate it the particular way he did? Well, we can think of it in this way. I'm leaving out the constants. But basically, we do an average. So, so this is a convolution. So that's the underlying operator. And now we're going to smooth it by doing an average over a two-by-two two block. Right, which is which corresponds to convolution with this, and you know, if you like, we can put in one over four. Um, not concerned about those multipliers at the moment. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, and what 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 do we get? Well, uh, hopefully you remember something about convolution. So we flip one of these. Well, that doesn't do anything to this because it's symmetrical, and then we shift it over the other one. So. Uh, the first position where we get something non-zero is when we have it in this position. And what do we get? We get minus 1. So then I take you know, so this operator and move it 1 to the right. Now it's overlapping in two places. I get minus 1 times uh, 1 is minus 1 plus, plus 1 times 1. That's 0. I uh, shift it over one more time. Now it's only overlapping over here, and I get uh, plus 1. OK. Then I move it one row down. And now I line it up over here, and I get uh, 1, 1 times minus 1, minus 1. That's minus 2. I shifted 1 to the right. They all cancel out, 0. Shifted 1 to the right. I get uh, 1, 1 times 1, 1 is plus 2. Uh, shift it down one more. I get minus 1, 0, plus 1. 
and there's uh, Irvin Sobel's uh, X operator, same in the Y direction. So we can think of um, it as uh, just a way of um, smoothing, and smoothing has the effect of reducing noise. So uh, unfortunately, it also has the effect of blurring things, making them, so there's a trade-off, obviously. Uh, we can um, reduce the edge uh, gradient uh, at the same time as we're cutting down on the noise. And uh, so Irvin Sobel managed to uh, avoid the half-pixel offset problem by having two operators, each of which is half-pixel offset, and when you convolve them together, you get zero or one or minus one offset. So, okay, so that's like the very front end of um, of this operation. Uh, and you know, they discuss, but they don't say you should use this or that. They just give various uh, formulas, and uh, um, the preferred one. So a lot of times it also say the preferred implementation, and that's kind of a a tricky one, because later on, if someone says, oh, but I didn't implement your preferred implementation, you know, the lawyer will say, well, you're talking about an exemplary implementation, not what's claimed in the patent. What's claimed in the patent is in the claims. What you say in the, in the specification is just a way for somebody to implement this. And just because yours doesn't implement it exactly the same way is irrelevant. What's relevant is whether it violates, infringes on the claims. And so a lot of times there'll be verbiage about, in a preferred implementation, the gain is 10 or whatever. So <coughs> if, if your gain is 11, that doesn't excuse you because the important part is whether the uh, claims cover it or not. Okay, so that's the very front end. And then we're going to uh, talk about... Um, the next step. Uh, so the next step is the conversion from uh, Cartesian to polar coordinates for the uh, uh, brightness gradient. And um, we'll do this mostly next time, but programming people will call it uh, a tan two of those two arguments and the reason is that we don't want to have division by zero which we can avoid by uh, using the two argument version of a tan okay so uh, now we have a gradient magnitude and we have a direction and the next step is to quantize the direction so what we're trying to find is a maximum in the direction across the edge so suppose the edge is running um, this way, brightness E1, E2. Then we want to scan across the edge and look for a maximum. E -O. And the direction is given by E theta. So that's why we need E theta and E naught. And unfortunately, we don't have points in all places in the plane, only uh, on this grid. So we can only deal with, uh, easily deal with uh, quantized directions. So we got, you know, compass directions, uh, eight possible uh, directions. And uh, we're looking for a, a maximum. And um, now on a different grid, we would have different quantization, but so, so we would still have a problem. Okay, so the center one is going to be uh, uh, G0. And then, so suppose this is our, this is our uh, uh, quantized gradient direction. And then we'll call the gradient here G plus and the gradient there uh, G minus. And so we have those three values. And... Um, Clearly, 
you know, the center pixel is an important one. It's, it's on the edge, but quantized to pixel position. So, so it doesn't give us uh, sub-pixel accuracy. So now uh, we, um, first of all, we uh, keep only if So we step through the image, and we ignore non-maxima. And um, now what we actually want is something that is asymmetrical. Okay. So it could happen that g0 is equal to g plus, or equal to g minus. And we could say, well, that means it's not a maximum, and just throw it out. But of course, that's wrong, because you, you know, we have to keep one of those two points. But we don't want to keep both because then we have two points on the edge that are on quote on the edge that are a pixel apart. So that's no good either. So we have to have a tiebreaker. So it's important that uh, this condition is asymmetrical. I mean, we can make it asymmetrical the other way. That'll also work. But but we need to have a way of dealing with a case where g zero is equal to g plus or equal to uh, g minus. Okay and. Then uh, we're trying to find the peak. Now, you know, how does the curve go? Well, we don't know, but uh, we can co imagine various kinds of. Uh, well, it's not a very good parabola, but okay. So we have uh, this is our parabola. We take its derivative and uh, there's the peak. And um, in terms of uh, these quantities here, uh, you know, if you go through and substitute, uh, if you fit A, B, and C, then uh, you, you get this formula. And um, well, here I've used x. Uh, here I'm using s. And we can show importantly that uh, s computed this way is a half, is limited in magnitude to a half. Uh, why is that? Well, if it was let's say three quarter, that would mean that uh, we'd be closer to this point, and then this should be the maximum. So you can actually show that can't happen. So it, that, that's its a range of solutions, provided g0 is the maximum. And you can sort of understand what's going on here. So if g plus is the same as g minus, s is 0. That's, you know, we're right at, we have a balanced parabola. We, ha we have this situation. Right, and and in this case, you know, of course, you would say, oh, that's it, right? It, if these two are the same, and then it gets shifted, the more there's a difference between the two sides, um, and how much does it get shifted by? Well, we look at the second derivative, which is uh, this difference here. Well, it's not the second derivative, but proportional to the second derivative. So we're looking at the average of g plus and g minus and comparing it to this point. And the larger that difference is, the higher the second derivative. So it, it just corresponds to you know, b is the first derivative, a is the second derivative. OK, so that's uh, one way of getting the subpixel accuracy. And then the other way they mention is are uh, the little triangle model. And that just seems weird, but um, for some reason, there are circumstances where it's a pretty good model. So again, we have the g0, g plus, g minus. Um, let's see. So this one. So um, again, with three measurements, we have just enough information to uh, fit this model. The assumption of the model is that the slopes of the two lines are the same. Uh, and then we just need to 
vertical position and horizontal position. And in this case, S comes out to be okay. And again, that formula is in the in the patent, and it's pretty easy to to derive. Um, okay. So there's, uh, we'll talk about this uh, pattern some more, um, but there's some interesting, um, you know, technical uh, issues uh, aside from the uh, from the uh, pat patentees uh, that we'll get to. Uh, you know, f for example, uh, a, one reason an edge might not be a uh, unit step edge is because of defocus. And so the question is, you know, what is the shape of that curve? Because this whole business here, we're just making, we're making up stuff. We're saying, oh, maybe it's a parabola or maybe it's a triangle. Uh, well, can't we just figure out exactly what it is? Uh, particularly in the case of defocus, we should be able to figure out just what, obviously it's not going to be a step edge anymore. It's going to be smeared out because it's blurred, it's out of focus. But what, what is that? So we'll talk about that and um, see how that affects our uh, method of recovering the actual edge position. And then we'll uh, talk about some alternatives to what's in the patent. Um, in particular, uh, you know, this quantization of uh, gradient direction is kind of problematic, uh, particularly on the square grid where we only got eight directions. And so we'll talk about other ways of uh, proceeding that do not have that very coarse quantization. You know, like here, we're finding a maximum in that direction or in this direction, but uh, if the gradient's actually in between, you know, it's not, anyway. So, so there's, there's more, and, and it seems like a very simple problem, but uh, it shows how, if you want really good performance, uh, there are a lot of details to figure out, like this business about, you know, what's a good way to compute the derivatives. So. Okay.